and welcome to this month's edition of Slugger TV. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the executive's new roadmap towards easing the lockdown, the change in strategy from the British government, and also how well has the devolved government been handling the COVID-19 outbreak. And to go through these important topics, we have the Irish News Security Correspondent, Alison Morse, and the Andersonstown News Columnist, Andrew Murphy. Alison, to you first. So the executive a few days ago published their long-awaited uh, roadmap for uh, easing the lockdown. We're now on week eight, going into week nine now of the lockdown. Um, how, what did you make of it? You you were there, you you saw them, um, oh, sorry, well, you virtually watched them uh, um, unveil it. What did you make of it? Yes, we don't get to be there anymore. Everything is done via Zoom these days, which makes um, it much easier for politicians to, to get away with not being held properly to account. But that's for another another question. I thought it was good that the fact that we actually have a plan now so we can see something. So my main criticism of Stormont up until then was, was the patronising nature in which they were treating people. So they were saying, well, we can't tell you what we're going to do because you'll all just go out and go mad then and nobody will abide by the lockdown. And I find that very patronising, given the fact that the levels here remain so low, you know, that the massive surge that was intended to come didn't come. And that was just down to people, you know, abiding by the rules and abiding by the regulations, abiding by the lockdown. And yet they were still being talked to as if they were three-year-olds. So it was good that we have the roadmap. I think that there's a number of reasons why you can understand why there's no date specific because it can't be date specific because each phase is going to be reliant on the phase that's came before it. And so we have to wait and see what happens and what the reaction is to the, the R number, to the reproduction rate after each phase. But I also think that there's probably another reason why that there's not dates. So had there been dates put in and had the dates been very similar, say, to the, the, the South's roadmap, which we have already seen and was seen previously, and which they didn't give the executive prior, prior knowledge of, I think that that would have been problematic for the DUP. He would have been accused of being wedded to a Dublin strategy. Had it been too close to what Boris Johnson was suggested, suggesting, I think that that would have been problematic for Sinn Féin. So I think it's good that they decided to just follow our own path. You know, let's do something that's good for this region. What they also did, I think, is they come out and at least front facing, maybe that's not what's going on behind the scenes, but at least to the public, they put on a united front. I think it's the most united they've been since this crisis has started. And I also think that's very telling that the other devolved regions have done the same thing. So Boris Johnson now has a plan for England. He's basically the Prime Minister of England. He's not the Prime Minister of anywhere else because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have all said, we're doing our own thing. We do not agree with what you're doing. We think it's reckless. We're going to do this instead. And I think that that has been interesting to watch because for the first time, and even during the Brexit debate, we didn't see that, but for the first time, we've seen all the devolved regions saying, no, no, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to design this, it's going to be bespoke and it's going to be tailor made to us. I think that was good to see, but each one of those stages needs more detail. There was a lack of detail in relation to what's going to happen to people at shielding, and there's a lack of detail in relation to childcare arrangements, all sorts of other things. But it was a good start and it was a united front. And I think that the way they presented it that day appeared at least for the public to be positive, and that's reassuring for people who are very anxious. Okay. Uh, Andre, what did you make of the of the strategy that was published? Well, I think that you have to look at when it came. We'd already seen Leo Bradker coming out and giving a very specific um, plan um, where you look down dates and you see your lived life in those dates. So when's my caravan going to be reopened again? When am I going to be able to meet my mates in the pub? Um, when can I plan my wedding for? And they've really, they, they've set that out and it was very, very clear. Then you had an, an Excel spreadsheet, you know, where you could kind of look it up and even colour code where you're going to be. And then you had Boris Johnson coming out with his, um, his plan on the Sunday night and it was completely different. You had a few doodles and a bit of a wave that kind of went in and around and then even had icons on the waves where you were trying to figure out what those icons were. Some of them had disappeared by Monday morning. Um, and so you kind of were left that you were going, well, I imagine if um, Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill are going to announce something, it's going to look a little bit more like what Leo Varadkar had announced, given what they'd said the previous Thursday. On the previous Thursday, they've come out and said, no, the lockdown's there for three more weeks. We know that it's difficult for people. We are going to have a plan. And you got a sense from that it was going to look a lot more like what Leo Bradker had said than what Boris Johnson had said. And right enough, they came along, it was a spreadsheet. And you could see colour codes as well. And you could see what's in there. A, a fair bit less detail. And obviously, the big difference, as Alison has said, was around the dates. And again, I think she's absolutely on the money. I think that has something to do with you know, if it looked like 
the 18th of May, the golf courses are opening in the south. If they were opening the golf courses in the north on the 18th of May, that would have been a bit difficult. But it's looking like they're not going to be too far off anyway, maybe 10 days between them in terms of the traction that's going to be there. I thought what was most interesting about the executive's uh, plan and roadmap was that it was very heavy on the technical detail of the stages. So you really saw reverting back to the conversation around testing, where that sits, um, where that was nearly forgotten about in what Johnson was talking about and Bradker hardly talked about it at all. You see the big role for testing in, in the executive's plan and the WHO was mentioned again as well. You know, back in March, we were all listening to Michael Ryan every day. Was it a pandemic? Was it not a pandemic? What were the expected measures that people should take? That has gone away where we hardly see Michael Ryan at all. The executive put the WHO right at the heart of this um, plan, which I thought was, was very interesting too. So you can see that they're not leaving themselves hostages to fortune. So if people are expecting their caravans to be open in Bundoran on the 20th of July in, in the south. People in the north are not being given a date because they don't want to leave themselves hostage to fortunes. But if it has to be the 25th of July or it has to be the 10th of August, they're not going to be leaving themselves open for too much criticism. That's probably wise from their point of view. Yeah. Um, and Alison, obviously, um, you've heard businesses come out. I mean, it was interesting. Um, you, know, you saw people like Simon Hamilton, who's now the chief executive of the Belfast Chamber, uh, coming out and, and, and criticizing or, or, or highlighting the lack of any dates and many other business associations kind of following. Do you think that's going to cut through with the public in terms of that frustration? Or do you think most people will go, actually, I understand why the executive are not putting dates? Well, I mean, as I said at the start, you can't actually put dates on this because you could say, I'm going to allow you to be expanded by this date, then the RA could shoot up and you'd have to say, no, we need to go back again. So it would have maybe been better to have maybe approximates within the space of the month and say, we hope that by the end of September, we will be in this place or by the end of August. That's neither here nor there. I think that we're going to move in three week slices. That's basically what's going to happen. And you can work out your own dates from that from there. Um, I think in relation to business, it's interesting because at the start of this, we heard a lot from people like Richard Branson. We know that Amazon is now going to set to be, you know, the world's first trillionaire or whatever as a result of the amount of extraordinary from there. And when people talk about business, they think about that. So they think about very rich people being concerned about keeping themselves very rich people. And that's what a lot of what Boris Johnson's deal appeared to look like. It was like, get back to work because people who were making lots of money from the, the, the working man and woman are not making lots of money anymore. But what we got to remember is we're not that kind of economy. We don't really have a lot of big business here. We have a lot of very small businesses that are very locally owned and they're owned by lo local families and they're owned by local people. And so business here is, you know, my mate who owns a nail bar. She's a business, you know. It is, you know, it is a girl who works in, you know, a clothes shop and raises her three children on that wage. That's business here too. So, and we need to remember that hospitality is such a big thing. And the furlough scheme at this point in time, especially I think in relation to hospitality, is masking mass unemployment because those businesses are never going to be able to open again. Um, the fact that we're going to have to live with social distancing probably for the foreseeable future. Most bars and restaurants, if you talk to the people who own them, they'll tell you their margins are so small. If they're only allowed to open half the amount of customers, they just couldn't open at all. So let's accept that those businesses are going to be gone. And then the, the assembly then now needs to come up with ways of creating and finding a new employment to replace those businesses. Um, and I think that all of that is something for further down the line and something that politicians are going to need to be questioned further on. What I do think is important is that you remember to separate big business away from people's livelihoods. So when we talk about big business and capitalism and putting wealth before health and all that, that's all fine in one respect, and that's true, and I couldn't care less about Richard Branson's millions, you know, he can go and live on his island and do whatever it is he does. But I do care about people who I know who have been working since they were 16, you know, to try and earn a living, who now think that they're going to end up back on the dole again, haven't worked for 20 or 30 years, I care about them. And I think that we need to separate that kind of business from the kind of business that we have here, and remember that we're a very different region from London. We do not have those big millionaires, you know, living on every street corner. We're a very different place. And so I think that that's good that our roadmap is tailor-made and bespoke. But it has to remember, you know, that talk, when we talk about business, we're not always just talking about capitalism and, and people exploiting workers. Sometimes, you know, we need to remember that it's families trying to feed their children is also business. Yeah, and Andre, obviously the big thing is about, you know, social, as Alison's pointed out there, social distancing isn't going away anytime soon. Michelle O'Neill and Arlene Foster are both stressing that, you know, we're going to have to change the way we do things, you know, in terms of when schools return and, you know, things like the 
queuing up outside supermarkets. If it's frustrating you now, it's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Face coverings now as well. What, what do you think about, about the messaging around, around that? Do, 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 do we think that, are, are people still with the executive on that or is there greater frustration? I think there's two. I don't think that there is frustration. I think people have adapted remarkably well to it. It's incredible how well a population can receive a message and adapt to new ways of doing things. So it's almost like anti-social if you're anyway less than two two meters beside somebody having a look at your yogurt in the, in, in the supermarket. But I think that what you know there is a lot of concern about. Well, what does that mean for the things that we expect to come back? So universities, you'll know this, you know, a lot of the universities are now contacting the people who, the students who are in second and third year, and they're saying, you can expect your first semester to be online learning. For new applicants and for people who are going in for the very first time, I think that is something that is a real concern. And also for some of the, the courses that are going to be run, it's okay to say, I'm going to do an online course in law for instance, or politics. But that's not okay for the first year nursing students or the first year medical students or engineering. It's quite, quite different. And, you know, we, there isn't an answer to it yet. No one has come up with an answer. And it could be that those things will be suspended far, far longer than maybe the things like where we go and get our geraniums, you know? And then that has the bigger knock on to the question you were asking Alison about the economy. So if we have this whole cohort of um, students who aren't going to be able to get into college, get their, get their degrees, and that's suspended by a year, then that has an, an obvious impact on the workforce and what comes later. So, you know, and then that's completely disregarding the arts and where the arts are at. You know, we, we have um, all relied on Netflix, Amazon Prime, all of those things in terms of keeping us occupied during a lockdown. You would think that our valuing of the arts would be greater, but of course it isn't. And so um, there's very little resourcing that's going toward the arts or toward all of those independent studios and filmmakers and scripts and authors and everyone else that's involved in that. That's not happening either. For us to adapt and create this new normal, though I hate the term, I think that we are going to have to get around our heads around, well, what does that look like for those applied things that we expect to see in our society? And it is going to look very different. And what, what I was really concerned about, and it didn't mention Burley at all in the roadmap, was a childcare in relation to not just the number of people who are employed in childcare, who are mainly women, and a lot of them are single parents and rely on that for their income. But for if you're trying to say to everyone, you got to go back to work, who minds those children? If you can find a way to change a child's nappy from two metres away, I would like to know what it is. How do you then, I mean, I've seen horrific pictures of children going back to school in other countries and standing in squares and boxed away from each other. And my heart is broke. I do not want the children of this pandemic generation to grow up thinking they can't touch someone or hug someone or if they fall over and cut their knee that you can't lift them up and give them a cuddle. And that sort of human interaction, it's so much part of our lives. And that's why when they keep on hearing this awful term that's follow the science, well, we're not following the science because the science shows the children... First of all, are not prone to this disease in any great numbers, and there's been only a very small minority around the world. So can we actually follow the science and look and see that how we can let these children live and thrive and be educated? Because the longer we keep going as we are, the longer the gap between children from poor families and children from rich families get. Homeschooling is lovely. If you live in a lovely house with a lovely kitchen, with a lovely kitchen table and a mummy and a daddy who are going to sit down at the computer every day for three hours, homeschooling if you have you know an autistic brother you don't even have a kitchen table to sit at you know you eat your dinner on your knee where do you even put it your mother can't afford the wi-fi bill every month for you to, to sign on to the online learning i mean where's your where's your schooling then and you can see that those things are getting so i mean in my column the irish news i did say you know we are all in this together but some of us have a bigger boat than others and there's some don't even have a boat you know some are clinging clinging to the, the side of a dinghy waiting on some kind of help and the longer this goes on the worse it is for them which is why some aspects of this laughter frustrated me so much because people have become so sanctimonious about it and so oh just get on dig in bury down if you had a day's hardship in your life you wouldn't be talking like that a, you know a comfortable lockdown is a privilege and i have a lot of privilege in my life and i know i do and i'm very grateful for to it but once upon a time i was an 18 year old mother in a flat in ross and we were damp crawling up the walls and i didn't have privilege then and I would have, don't know how, I would have survived this period in those circumstances. And so we have to be mindful that it's okay telling people it will take as long as it takes. 
But we have to remember that as long as it as long as it takes might be too long for some people. It might be just too long for them to be able to bear. And uh, Andre, I want to come to you on this because this is a big uh, bugbear of mine, and it's been it's been raised. Um, Alison has raised this. The Irish government, you were pointing out, announced their strategy, and uh, they didn't consult the Northern Ireland executive. Now, not for the first time, uh, when Leo Varadkar announced he was closing schools from Washington, he didn't consult the Department of Education up here or anyone in the Northern Ireland executive. And the reason why I bring it up is Michelle O'Neill was on Virgin One's The Tonight Show uh, in Dublin this week, and she was talking about that, the frustration that she felt that the that the Irish government weren't consulting with the Northern Ireland um, executive. What did you make of that again for a second time in a month, it, it emerging that, uh, that that a big announcement was made and there wasn't consultation from Dublin to Belfast? Well, there were two things that occurred to me. The first thing that was obvious is that you have a Taoiseach there who, during the Brexit negotiations and throughout that entire period, undoubtedly promoted the idea that he was connected to the north in unprecedented ways the border didn't really exist and he was looking out for all of these citizens who were living north of the border through the brexit campaign that seemed genuine to me and to a lot of other people then you come to what has happened just running into the general election in the south and absolutely subsequently to that where anything to do with the north can be seen through the prism of whether how you view Sinn Féin. And that is an, something that he never did during the Brexit negotiations and is quite extraordinary because there is no doubt that it is being interpreted as a way, as a furtherance of the Fine Gael policy that they won't go into government in the South with Sinn Féin. And so they are um, delineating the North as some sort of extension of that policy. And so what that's doing is, you have a Northern executive that undoubtedly has had a long and protracted conversation about whether there's going to be, whether there's going to be an all island approach in terms of policy on Brexit uh, or on, in terms of the pandemic. Um, and there has been an espousing that it makes sense to do it on an all island basis. And instead you have a Southern government that isn't a willing partner in that. And that completely undermines everybody. Yeah, I mean, Alison, it was interesting where um, Arlene Foster was saying as First Minister that she wouldn't wouldn't oppose any North-South initiatives that were there. But yet again, you see uh, throughout the pandemic, it seems to be the consultation has fallen down at Dublin's end rather than Belfast's end. So. It, it was interesting because I agree entirely with what Andre was saying. During Brexit, Leo Bradger used this to try and, you know, when he had visits here and he went and visited, you know, the, the um, Orange Waters Museum and he was reaching out to all sections of of and said that Irish people in, in the north would not be left behind and then what happened was an election all of a sudden Sinn Féin became rivals like actual genuine rivals for government and to give them a foresight or to treat them like a party of government in the north would then increase their power in the south and so he has decided to completely cut them off and to try then and go his own way rather than give any credit to a mandatory coalition government in the north that had Sinn Féin as one of its joint equal um, partners and that has been really obvious. I think it's been obvious to people in the north. And, and I think that where it'll really disappoint is those people who live in those border regions. So if you live in some of those areas, you know you might cross that border 10 times a day. You know, your you know, your farm might be in the south and your house might be in the north, and you and you're so aligned to both sides. And now we're gonna have a situation where there will be a, a divergence in relation to legislation on both sides of the border. There will be a difference in relation to what way they move. And I think that the real problem that we can see coming down the road is in relation to the um, test track and uh, trace app mm. because that app we do not know if that app is going to work in conjunction with the one in the south and i mean if anyone who you know who lives you know in in Derry or, or lives in Ireland, i'll tell you the problems they have with their mobile phone <laughs> and wi-fi yeah. system when they cross from one end to the other never mind you know a tracing app that they're telling yeah. us is the answer to getting the aria down and to letting us all escape from lockdown and if they can't get that technology to work and they can't come to an agreement and there's there's so much more involved in this and probably you know people much geekier than even yourself if that's <laughs> hard to imagine i know but there are people like that who you know will be able to tell you that in relation to that technology and to try and get that work in, in relation to data protection stuff on both sides of the border in two jurisdictions is just a massive nightmare and um, i think that coming down the road we'll see that and that's going to really test the cooperation between north and south but what it has done and what the positive aspect of that is is we had a very divided executive at the start of this problem and because London has behaved so recklessly 
And Dublin is just basically, you know, through a strop and decided they're going to have a hissy fit and run off on their own. It's gelled them together. And we can now see that they're saying, right, look, let's forget about them and let's forget about them. What's best for us? And they're taking a, a problem look. And for such a, a fledgling government than it is, remember, this is only back from January. Nobody knew when it went back in January that they were going to be facing this. So for a government in basically in crisis footing, the fact that they have had, you know, no help from uh, from Dublin who are, are treating this like, you know, at this point, they could poor relatives um, and how and Boris was able to work with. I think that that has in some way it's made unionists think twice about their their loyalty to London, and it has also made Republicans think, well, hold on a wee second, if you're going to behave like this, well then we're going to need to take another look at what our relationship is with you, and we're going to maybe need to behave in a different way. And so that's I think partly responsible for what we now see is a much more united executive than we've seen at the very beginning of this health crisis. So, because uh, you've, you've just pivoted nicely on to, to the next topic I wanted to go on to. So, um, obviously, Boris Johnson gave a, a big uh, UK-wide State of the Nation address on Sunday night on the main networks, um, announcing a change in British government strategy. But it became very clear in the lead up to that, that again, this strategy was only going to apply to England. Uh, the Welsh government made clear they were going to go their own way. Nicola Sturgeon was clear she was going her own way. The Northern Ireland Executive made clear a few days before that they were going to go uh, their own way. So it, it, is his change of message, is it exposing problems within the union? I think that the union was already under huge pressure as a result of Brexit, and we've seen that. And it's completely Westminster's own fault. They are little Englanders. They've always, they're only looking to England. The Tory party is only interested in England. And they very clearly met, have demonstrated that throughout throughout a long time, but particularly during the Brexit negotiations. So Boris doesn't need anyone except England. The, you know, his approach in focusing on England is not something he's done. It's something that Scotland, Wales and here in the North we've done because of necessity, because we know that they don't have the economic or even health interests of, of the people, of the citizens who live in those different areas at heart. So in terms of the pandemic, the undermining of Westminster began when the words herd immunity came out. So, and that was very early on into March where we realized that they wanted to go this completely different approach. They weren't even going to order ventilators together with the rest of the EU partners. They, they took this very um, middle class, you know, uh, Colonel Webley blows the whistle and the troops will go over the top and that will sort it out approach from day one which has really undermined them. They kind of crawled it back a bit when Boris Johnson fell sick. And then he comes back into the, into the picture, start, gives a complete nonsensical, um, very difficult to understand uh, broadcast on Sunday night. And, you know, it just, it just copper fastened people's determination that they were going to look after their own citizens and they can't rely on Westminster to do anything. Does that undermine the union? Of course it does. And we have a parallel conversation happening here about where the future of um, constitutional arrangements might lie uh, as a result of Brexit. And now we have this adding into it. And it really does give a sense that people who are the citizens here will be voting with their feet and where they think their best interests will lie, whether it's going to be with Dublin or with London. And, you know, the, the proof of the puddings in the Eton, they don't care about us economically proving that through Brexit. They don't care about whether we live or die and they're proving that through coronavirus. Okay. Um, uh, Alison, what do you make of the, 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 the forward motion of the union throughout this? I, I think, as always, Nicola Sturgeon has been the first to go, hell on a second, you know, I don't think so. I'm not following this nonsense. I mean, this man's just being reckless. And the problem that Boris Johnson has is on one hand, he achieved all those votes in the north of England and those, you know, that, that he broke that red wall and he got those very working class people to vote for the Conservative Party. So he knows he needs to keep those votes. But at the same time, too, he has went into big business and his friends are big business and the Tory donors and the people who hang around, you know, the, 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 st the people whose stocks are damaged by people dying, you know, he's, he's wedded to them. And so he's trying to make it, trying to ride two horses at the same time. So he's trying to say, oh, well, I'm going to protect you and this is what we're going to do for this but, but also I need to get people back to work because my mates are losing money um, and at, at that stage I think that uh, Scotland has always been very clued in to the fact that the interests of the Tory party do are very narrow and that they are very um, not just English centric very London centric um, and so she said at the start no I don't think so what was she said I don't even know what Stella it means which is, is you know 
hilarious. I mean, she just basically dismissed him as an idiot and a, a bit of nonsense and did her own thing. And then I think that Wales very quickly fell into line here. And I think that at that stage, we weren't hearing much from the assembly. We were meant to get this roadmap. Do you remember earlier? It was meant to come the week before. And we were told it wasn't going to come until the Monday or Tuesday. Um, now, at that stage, it was, are they waiting to see what Boris Johnson says? Are they waiting to see, you know, what aspects of that? But I actually don't think that they were at that point. I think that they were ironing out because the conversation had changed to let's wait and see what Westminster's doing, let's wait and see the Dublin's doing, to, let's do what we think might be best mm. for us. But, I mean, it is my job as a journalist is that document is far from perfect. It has gaps in it all over the place and those need to be fleshed out. And so we have to continue mm -hmm. to, at the same time, while we support people and we know that there's a pandemic and we have politicians working in a crisis situation, that doesn't mean that they get, you know, a, a free ride. They still have to be answerable for what it is they're doing and we still have to flesh out what it is those aspects mean. So we do have... As Andre says, lovely colour coordinated, you know, um, little bar. We, we know when we're, we're, we know we have a rough idea of when we're going to be able to, you know, get our hair done and go for a drink. But we don't exactly know the details of that. And the, the details of that are, are far more important than those are first world problems, let's face it. You know, the main problem is what are we going to do about children and how are we going to get their lives back on track again? What are we going to do about their education? What are we going to do about the elderly? What are we going to do about those that are shielding? What are we going to do about childcare? What are we going to do about getting, you know, an economy that can support people up and going so we don't have, you know, 1980s level of Maggie Thatcher's, you know, unemployment, people queuing up outside those. Because if something isn't done in order to try and mitigate what the, the, the mess that this has created, so we've done some for a very specific reason, but it only was for one reason. And remember that had a knock on effect and all sorts of other things like cancer treatments and, and all sorts of other elective surgeries. The reason we have an assembly right now, and you know, imagine we didn't have one and we were letting Westminster deal with this crisis, is because there was 300,000 people on a health service waiting list and the nurses were striking and the, you know, the public spoke and the pressure was put on people to get back up and get devolution back up and running again. Those 300,000 people didn't just disappear overnight, they still exist and they're still on a waiting list and they still need dealt with. So I mean, I don't envy them, it was a huge, huge, huge job. But at the same time, too, we are much more than coronavirus. We are so many more pieces of a, a puzzle that need sorted out. And I think that now we've seen the R rate has down. This roadmap must take into consideration all the other things that were neglected during that period. And when we talk about, and Andre hates new normal, as I point out, some people's normal wasn't great anyway. It wasn't that nice, and they're not in that great a rush to get back to it. They would like a new way of living. And I think that that is the opportunity. Is you know, everything is burnt down now and we have an opportunity to build something better. Whether we will or not, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about, we're now more than two months into uh, this um, this pandemic. Um, and I, and I want to, Are you sure? It, it's more than two months. It's just <laughs> over two months. years. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just over two months now. Um, uh, and Andre, I want to go to you on this. Um, the Northern Ireland Executive, as Alison was pointing out earlier, it only came back into office in fairly early January. Um, and then within a month, it is faced with COVID-19. Um, how do you think so far, altogether, it, it's handling it? Is, it? is it proven its worth as a devolved government or is it maybe kind of just average? I think Alison was right when she said, imagine a world where we didn't have it. So undoubtedly having it has been immensely valuable. Um, despite all of the bumps which we actually would have expected it to have, um, we probably would have expected there to be maybe more arguing or for it to be even less um, proactive than it's been. I mean, there's been some real standout performances by some of the, the uh, ministers and Dirty Hargy was probably the one that affected, was fa fastest out of the traps saw where people were going to, to be. They were going to be on the dole. They were going to be losing their jobs. She saw it quicker than most people. And so she made it easier um, and as much as she could for people to be able to apply for universal credit, for them to um, ensure that they wouldn't have to go to assessments for PIP or whatever they, they were going to be or do telephone assessments. So, you know, she, she suddenly, certainly stood out in, in many respects in terms of being in tune with the working classes. Um, I think, though, in a, in a general respect, you've also seen a very different approach um, probably by the two uh, main parties, the DUP and Sinn Féin, to um, devolved government, where um, I think very early on into the pandemic, you saw what the term no return to the status quo actually means. So you saw that the, um, 
that the parties did the press the press conference together, that famous scene where all the ministers were together and were following Westminster's lead. And within 24 hours, Michelle O'Neill, having got an absolute roasting about it, comes out, stands at the bottom of the stairs on her own and says, I think the schools should close. Um, a very lonely place for her in terms of what that looked like. But that's what, it, you know, that's in a physical manifestation, what no return to the status quo, mean, quo means. It means that all of that before where there were arguments between the DUP and Sinn Féin, and we all knew that they were having arguments, and we knew that there was tensions um, that resulted in a lot of paralysis, um, is not the order of the day now. The arguments will be in the open, and people will either move or they won't. There couldn't be no movement around the pandemic, so everyone had to move. Everyone had to find a place where they would where they would shift. So something like uh, Robin Swan announcing that there would be um, a, a morgue in a, fall, in a former army barracks, or that the British Army had been requested to come in without an obvious need, I think um, could have created a far bigger um, storm between all of the parties had that been at any other time. In a pandemic, Sinn Féin clearly made a decision that this was not the trench they were going to die on. And so, they, so the all-island approach was something that they focused on instead. The DUP for Arlene Foster has the pandemic has I think really saved her. So the RHI report went completely unnoticed. She didn't take the heat that everyone expected her to get, and so but she's come out as a real standout performer herself. Herself and Michelle O'Neill's own performances I think have been outstanding, um, in terms of press and in terms of how they look and uh, how um, what looks like leadership. She isn't falling out with anyone or being cranky or all of those things that we saw before. So I think that, you know, um, you can see that they're, that they're laying a foundation which you wouldn't have expected as a result of the pandemic. Okay. Alison, in 30 seconds, uh, your quick analysis of, uh, of where you think, how you think the executive has performed overall. I think it, it just to quickly, I would, just, I would agree in relation to the first and deputy first minister with Andre. And the reason is, you know, you took away, the, so you put social distancing in place and you took away all those people who stood around those two women. You realised they, did, they didn't need that, you know, donut of men hanging around their back of the yes. women. They're quite able to stand there on their own, on their own two feet and speak by themselves. And I think that now that we've seen that, we've known that they're, they're both quite capable. I think that Michelle O'Neill was always criticised a lot. I think the fact, the fact that she was now elected officially by Sinn Féin has actually empowered her. And I can see that she seems much more confident in herself. And, and I think that this has brought out the best of them. And I will say that even members of Sinn Féin, I think at the time, there was some complaining internally about Deirdre Harvey being brought in and co-opted and made a minister. Without, and you can see now why. I don't think there's too many people questioning that now. Talk about, you know, if we, we come to the end of this pandemic and we have to you know, rate those ministers in terms of who really stood up to the plate and who didn't, I think that Deirdre Harvey will come out top as her performance so far has been outstanding. Yeah, 100% agree with you on Deirdre Harvey. I think she's been the standout performer. Uh, thank you so much for your views. I um, want to thank my, our guests, uh, Andre Murphy, Alison Morris. That is it for this month's edition of Slugger TV. We'll be back next month. You can keep up to date with everything in the meantime on sluggerotool.com. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.